This is Father Gregory Pine. And this is Father Bonaventure Chapman. And welcome to God's Planning. Thanks to all those who support us. If you enjoy the show, please consider making a monthly donation on Patreon. Be sure to like and subscribe to God's Planning wherever you listen to your podcasts. Father Bonaventure. Father Gregory, my name is too long. Um, now that we do this whole like name thing at the start, this is Father Gregory Pine. This is Father Bonaventure Chapman. It just, woof. It is math. I mean, it's four syllable front. Chapman's only got two, but it seems like a long two or something. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what to do about that. I'm happy about it, but uh, I almost never say Bonaventure Chapman. Yeah, you know? that's that's rare. And it's you have to say it reasonably. It's Unless a name. you're at the Religious Life Bank. <sighs> yeah. Or, you know, Mutual Trust and Security Fund, yeah, like local regional branch. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. So I've, that's what I've noticed with these sort of things is it's uh, it's kind of race, especially with Gregory Pine, because that's a three syllable guy. Yeah. Um, so it's like short, long, short, long, real little, um, what do you call that, Morse code action going on. But here's the thing. I've thought about this some because when I was taking, uh, you know, like when we had the option to take religious names, yes. you went for it. I kind of not really went for it. Um, I was cowardly. You were bold. Um, so I, I chose Gregory Maria, mm. right? I could have chosen Gregory Mary, but to me, it sounded like an old English rowing hymn, you know, mm-hmm. like Gregory and Mary. Um, it just sounded too like, huh, huh, the type yeah. of thing that you might grunt out between taking shots from three point land at a pickup basketball game. So I, I picked Gregory Maria cause it kind of has more shape to it, both sonically yeah, it and does. just orthographically. Mm-hmm. And I think what's cool about your name is that it has a kind of noble shape. It is, it is a hall. Right. Bonaventure is a hall. Yeah. And then Chapman, you got like a big letter yep. and then a, like a big letter and then you got a big letter and then like, like it's got a little plosive right in the middle. Yeah. yeah. Now you yeah, got a nice yeah. name. So I wouldn't back off that. No, I mean, like, it's just it's yeah. For a conversation for conversational style, it's regal. It's too regal, you know, but yeah. I like it. It's fine. I'm not going to change my name. Don't worry. No yeah. need to suggest anything in the comments. It's fine. Um, yeah. <laughs> Wait, where was he from? He was like Banyo Regio. Yeah, yeah, Bagnareggio. Yeah, okay. So if you yeah. had insisted on taking like Bonaventure hyphen Bagnareggio, yeah. Chapman, I think that would have been excessive. Aggressive. Or I was right. hoping for Bonaventure Faustina Chapman, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we're not allowed to take female except for the Blessed Virgin, which is fine. I right. get it. I get it. Yeah. Uh, and Bonaventure Mary just seemed too, you know, BMC. Yeah, yeah, I got you. I yeah, no, that. I mean, it's just what it, it is. is. You know, yeah. you got to choose and you chose. Yeah. So I think there's a nobility to. The single name, lengthy, yeah, but huh, right, yeah, um, strong, and then yeah. followed by a kind of quintessentially. Yeah, when you hear Bonaventure, I suppose you think of like um, I don't know, wrought iron or something like yeah. this sort of spy, you know, old Gothic kind of stuff. That's fair, Norman. So I should say Norman candlesticks and that kind of thing. That's yeah. Yeah, I would say you're like a uh, an Ionic or maybe a Doric column. You know, Ooh. like long, noble, not especially ornate, but sturdy. It's yeah. the type of thing that you can find in an excavation 3,000 years later. Yeah. That's Whereas fair. I would say I'm more like a Corinthian or Tuscan. Those mm. capitals are always wrecked when you find them under piles of rubble. Corinthian's, because the Corinthian's pretty flowery. It is. Fl- mine's I mean, a little a flowery. lot of action there. I mean, it's a Gregory Marie. Yeah. It's not about length. Yeah, it's kind of like, ooh, ooh, ooh. yeah. But that's um, not besides the point. That's decidedly the point. Um, uh, insofar as we're talking about something not at all related, but which is now about to come up. So Let's do it. in the spirit of seamless transitions, it is time for us to transition. Yeah. So in these episodes, we'll often talk about our dissertations mm-hmm. as we get into a topic. And as we come to the end of that process, we're going to have to find other things to talk about. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't say like we're not necessarily like complaining about our dissertations in some are, insofar as we're like exploring existentially the territory of our dread, sorrow, excitement, agony, ecstasy, all the above, right? It's kind of like- Mapping the emotions. Yeah, it's an emotion map. Um, But yeah, as we transition into different things uh, in ecclesial life and ministry, uh, you know, we find other things to describe, but I think it's also helpful um, as as an exercise to think about the intellectual life as we have come to love it, as we have come to practice it. Because sometimes when we complain about our dissertations, Mm -hmm. people are like, why are you doing them? It's like, no, 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 you don't understand. Like, I love this. If I had a thousand lives to live, I would write a dissertation in every single one of them. Um, So I feel like we have to frame that conversation so that it's more comprehensible, even while we are probably not going to return to that conversation too terribly often. 
Well, and that's a good point about the complaining and whether it's <clears throat> something you really love or not. I mean, you could you could imagine someone complaining about their child all the time, and this is what mothers and fathers do. And, oh, I can't believe you're doing this. And someone could say, wow, why would you even have one? And it's like, no, no, I mean, the complaints are in the fact that I'm spending all my time loving these sort of things, so I have to occasionally make side comments, and it's just something I'm in all the time and experiencing these struggles, so the complaints are there reminding me of what my main love is. I mean, so we complain about the things we're most passionate about, uh, whether for good or ill. So that's a part of it, and the intellectual life is what we complain about sometimes because it's all we do, in a way. We do the devotional life, too, prayer sometimes. But intellectual life is, is particularly for us, at least for me, and for you as Dominicans in general. Um, and humans more broadly, humans are more broadly, are we hit things with our minds, you know? Animals hit things with their teeth and their claws and their feet. And we do that, but we, uh, we as, we're, we're rational animals, so that means we can strike things with our minds. You know, and, my, and things can strike us in our minds as opposed to just merely our skin, that sort of thing, in a crude analogy. And the intellectual life is about opening up that life of the mind. I'm reminded of, is it Bout of Buster Scruggs? I think it's actually Barton Fink. Barton that's what Fink, I think. Yeah. that's right. Yes, where, uh, where um, John Goodman is mm -hmm. wandering around the hall of a hotel on fire mm -hmm. with a shotgun yelling, behold the life of the mind. Mm -hmm. Um, and I want to behold that, shotgun or fire or not. <laughs> All right. So maybe as an entree to yeah, our impressions on the intellectual <clears throat> life, not as like a snooty, a feat pursuit, but as something that's actually part and parcel of Christian life. Okay. So we're made to the image and likeness of God, which means that we have a mind with which to know and a heart with which to love. And we want to exercise that mind and heart um, in accord with, you know, the gift God has mm -hmm. given us. And that'll mean prayer, certainly, but it also means a modicum of study, or it means kind yeah. of like pay attention, paying well, attention to reality and the totality of its factors such that as contemplatives, we profit from it. Like we, we draw forth from it so that we can be in more perfect communion with God. So, you know, under this rubric, thinking about the intellectual life as part and parcel of Christian life, sure. what was it that first drew you to the intellectual life? Um, I had to be science, I think, really. You know, I mean, we, we might not be dissimilar to this, um, although that book titled The Intellectual Life by Sir Shalange is more more important to you than it was to me, well, I have it. Um, it was for Stephen Hawking, I think, A Brief History of Time. I remember my father had this book, um, an old copy, but I still have the particular copy. It was like the first book I read with in desire for the intellectual things because it was the realization that I could see things and grasp things in the world with my mind that you couldn't see with your eyes. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. Science, mathematics, particularly physics and about black holes and all this. So for me, the intellectual life it started in the rarefied realms of, of physics, modern physics and that and the the accounts that Hawking gave and um, Brian Greene and some other just popular physicists and then doing the math, hard mathematics as entering into college. But the life of the mind developed for me in the abstract physics because I was looking for what's really, really, really real. And because I wasn't a scholastic at that point, um, physics was, of course, physics was kind of the really real back in the day in Aristotle's time too, right? The metaphysics is just a bunch of stuff you know, added to the physics to kind of make sense of it. So physics is not entirely strange, but it is the abstractness of it, which needs an intellect to know. And I think maybe that's how a lot of people get into the, and that's where the nerdiness comes from, that mm. they get into the intellectual life from the, from the sciences kind of stuff. Uh, and then it's a matter of moving uh, more broadly from that and developing an intentional intellectual life such that you can see everything in this particular way, or grasp it in this intellectual fashion, have a certain distance to it, you know, a contemplative, a contemplative groping, or, I mean, the German's great on this, because uh, uh, the concepts, of course, are begre begriffs, you know, so begreifen is to, is to grasp, begreifen is to grasp, begreifen is to, is to grasp a concept, to conceptualize, mm -hmm. and I think that's, that's what you're supposed to do with reality is to grasp it conceptually. That's how we order ourselves in a way that others don't. And that's for me, it was the sciences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's similar to you. I, just, I don't know, but you grew up in a Catholic world. And the beauty about the Catholic faith is there are so many big concepts and like bootstrapping intellectual realms. Are, they're already there, like launch pads. So you could have gotten through it without math and sciences, but I suspect 
most intellectuals kind of start there, especially modernity. Yeah, maybe. Um, I don't know that I know most intellectuals in the 20th or 21st century, but... I know most. I am. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, respect. Um, so in my case, uh, so I went to public school, so I was never really introduced to the Catholic intellectual tradition, properly so-called, or really like the Western intellectual mm -hmm. tradition as a coherent narrative or a mm -hmm. coherent tradition. It was just like, you'd go to this subject and then you go to this subject and then you go to this subject and you go to this subject and you like some of them more than you like others. Mm -hmm. And my experience of math and science was, this is pretty straightforward and I'm pretty good at it. Party on. Okay. My experience of history and of like English or language arts, as it was called back in the day, was that as we as we went along, like like greater stress was placed on interpretation. And I found that interpretation was often vexed mm -hmm. or contentious. And I was like, wait a second, what's going on here? You know, like, why can't we agree about this stuff? Is it because it's purposefully ambiguous or is it because, I don't know, we just can't agree upon it or like what's going on? But yeah. I kind of grew weary of it mm -hmm. um, in a way that I still don't know how to characterize, but whatever. So I like took a course at the community college so that I didn't have to take English my senior year. And I just doubled up on math and science. And I was like, yeah. this is great. If I could speak in numbers, I would. Pound it. But then when I went to Franciscan University of Steubenville, I majored in humanities and Catholic culture. Uh, the director of the program, Professor James Gaston, who had a vision um, mm -hmm. that like culture was an intelligible unit of study insofar as it actually mm -hmm. like manifest and communicated not just the thoughts of a particular community, but also their like folkways, workways and placeways, which is to say it, it, it actually gave you an intelligible whole. It gave you something with an integrity. Mm -hmm. So like you can study the ears and the eyes and the nose and the mouth in abstraction. You're like, cool ears mm -hmm. and eyes and noses and mouths but they're meant to be you know conceived within the context of the face because the face is their setting oh. it's their you know it's their ultimate purpose not just in a functional way but in like a this is tending towards not structural use, way. but yeah exactly yeah. and so like when this was explained to me i was yeah i was amazed i was astonished i was mm. begeistered yeah that's what this should um and I had a class my freshman year called Religion and Culture. And in that class, we read The mm -hmm. Intellectual Life by oh, A.G. Yeah. Sertiange. Mm -hmm. And so it was commended to us as yeah. an actual interior discipline. Yes. That you can approach reality yeah. in a way that actually conduces to the discovery of reality, right? So that you can be conformed to reality and like harmonize with reality. Mm -hmm. Not like a weird Eastern way, but in the sense that like, all right, man is a microcosm of this macrocosm, but this microcosm is meant to reflect this macrocosm. So that way we can occupy our place within the cosmos yeah. and to do so in a way that's happy, healthy, holy. Living in the truth. Yeah, or exactly. Monsignor Sokolowski talks about being agents of truth so that our, our, our cognitive activities are res truth responsive to the reality itself. Yeah. All right. So thinking then mm, about the, the intellectual discipline. life as part and parcel of every Christian vocation, what do you think are like, yeah, some ways in which we experience this or what are some ways in which, you know, like the ordinary church going Christian sure. can cultivate habits of mind and heart, which help to like approach reality in this way. So it's important to say that yeah, when you, the way you get into the intellectual life need not be the way that you stay in the intellectual life. And you mm -hmm. might've said, oh, well, I was never really interested in math and science or, or this sort of thing. But just as a human being, you have an intellect. Um, if you're listening to this podcast and anything's happening other than random shapes uh, <laughs> and like sonic <laughs> sonic pulses, then you have an intellect and ready to rock and it's meant to be used. And that doesn't mean all of a sudden you've got to use giant words. Um, I was thinking you used map. I used map earlier and I should have used cartography or something uh -huh. instead for you. Yeah. Um, but some something you don't have. The words, it's the concepts that really matter. Words are mapping on concepts in some way, but uh, this is a semantic issue. But the important thing is you have this you have this mind, you're meant to use it just like you have hands. Wow, I should probably hold stuff with this, otherwise they get atrophied. The mind, mind is meant to be used. But you, know, you can use your hands in certain ways and use them in, in poor ways. The mind too needs to be exercised in a virtuous way. And not, not the moral, not in the sense of like thinking about good things, that's important, but the way you think. I think Augustine is the, the progenitor of this idea of, of the attempt, of understanding of the different ways that we use our intellects. Virtuously, he calls studiositas, the studiousness. And we have a sense of this as being a studious person, studying, versus curiositas, curiosity. And I think we live in a world that is dedicated because of technology and Heidegger and different questions. Um, uh, to curiositas, not just the fall, but the fall in its, in its manif specific manifestation. 
and this is true for the timing and all this, we, we all feel the drive to know in order to love, and we need to shape that, we ought to shape that in ways that are conducive to living the intellectual life as the human life, but instead we kind of flip back and forth. I find, I like to think that I've, I work on the intellectual life in a way that, you know, the more the most do is why we're doing our, our PhDs anyway, and we want to live a life of study. Yet at the same time, I feel the pull of curiositas. I have the noetic effects of sin. They're there. And the mind is driving towards this and this and this. And once I read like a half a page of something or like the first chapter of a book, there's this drive to say, you've got all you need. Just flip the conclusion and you've mastered it and go on to something else. As opposed to, no, no, I've got this book. It's got five chapters. I need to study it. I need to act like it has something to say to me, not me interrogate it. Curiosity curiosity to us is like poking little animals and figuring out, making them do things for you, like making them play tricks. Whereas studiositas is the kind of nature observer looking and being patient, waiting for it to come out and to reveal itself, expose itself. And that's what reality is doing in studiositas is we are passive in a way to it. We're contemplative to it. But it, it is a discipline because it's so much easier to just go and start poking and prodding and get a few little tidbits. And other people feel the same way. And so we live in this curiosity world where your currency is little tidbits and little factoids, as opposed to the patient distinctions and, uh, what should we say, nuanced accounts of things, you know? So it's, it's a discipline, uh, but it's, it's so satisfying when you grasp a text or an idea or something in this patient way, because you know it well, and you are known in it because you've used yourself in this way. Yeah, I think here of a line that begins the intellectual life, it's like on page four or something where he says, the truth serves only its slaves. And Sertion mm. pairs it with this concept that you have to love the truth more than yourself, mm -hmm. all right? So there's a kind of act <clears throat> of fealty, right? whereby you, you know, kind of place your sword on the altar of truth. Mm -hmm. Because I think many of us are tempted to serve only ourselves. And uh, we only do things for our own self-aggrandizement. And we might not necessarily describe ourselves in that way. Or realize it. Or realize it. But when we interrogate our motivations, our intentions, the way in which we actually comport ourselves in the world, sometimes we just, yeah, we just want to be liked or we want to be praised. You can just think about the litany of humility and then find there a good examination of conscience for the ways in which pride, vainglory, and curiosity creeps in. And so when St. Thomas talks about the, the particular virtue of studiousness, right, he puts it under temperance, right? So temperance has a way of bridling the appetites. Mm -hmm. It reins the appetites in lest they be too spirit in their pursuit of whatever good. And then it's under modesty, okay? Mm -hmm. So modesty has four different sub-virtues, the first of which is humility, all right? And the next of which he describes is studiositas. So he says it's a kind of moderation of our desire to know. It's a moderation of our intellectual appetite, mm -hmm. not in the sense of will, but in the sense of this kind of more basic yearning after knowledge or yearning after information or yearning after wisdom. And so what happens with curiositas is it's unbridled or it's an inordinate you know, appetite for knowledge or information or whatever. And he'll describe how this might crop up. And I mean, like straightforward ones would be like, if you desire to know a thing um, that needn't be known, right? Um, like you want to know about new age stuff, right? And it's just like, you don't need to know about that. Or you want to know about what's going on in national politics when mm -hmm. you're basically certain that it's just going to stir you up, make you angry or make you sad or whatever. And he talks about like, we can also fail to inquire into the things which most merit our inquiry and instead choose lower things by whatever, by fell preference. Mm -hmm. So it's like, yeah, it's as Christians, um, you know, God is a claim on our lives. And part of our vocation as Christians is to seek to know something about God. But instead, we might dedicate all of our time to knowing everything there is to be known about, you know, the trade deadline and cap space and, you know, like luxury tax and the Philadelphia 76ers and how James Harden's mm -hmm. new contract is going to accommodate the acquisition of Daniel House and PJ Tucker and De like DeAndre Melton, you know, so like one could do that. And then he talks about how you might use illegitimate means for the acquisition of knowledge, like 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 seances or like reading the whatever. On Wikipedia. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or he says like one of the last ones is failing to refer the things that you know to God. 
Mm -hmm. All right. So like you just want to know the trivia for the trivia's sake. So that way at whatever party you can impress people with your arcane knowledge yeah. or whatever it is, you know, so like basically there's an appetite to know because knowing is delightful, but we have to discipline that appetite so that we exercise it in a way that actually conduces to the glory of God and the salvation of souls, not just in the abstract, but in my concrete and particular life. Um, so yeah, as we think about that, maybe we could start describing our own practices that work or what we've seen work in other people's lives, maybe some tips and tricks for yeah. how folks can uh, can seek to cultivate these types of habits of mind and heart. Well, I think one of the important parts with any, any sort of habit that you're developing or practice is to start off at a good place, to start off with one small chunks with any, as of anything, the mind is this practice, the habit is just like everything other, anything other practice or exercise of a skill or aptitude we have. So you don't, decide to start praying uh, by saying, I'm going to pray two, two hours a day, every day. It's not going to happen. You have to build up. You don't decide to play tennis by saying, I'm going to, I'm going to play for tw two hours in a row. It's not going to happen. You start a little consistently. So it's a matter of one, choosing the time and the mode uh, of, of the practice of this. And I think that's, you should probably say, I'm going to read a little bit less time than I would expect because we're always, I think, going to overreach. Now, if you're a person who consistently underreaches and everything, go ahead and just decide yourself whatever number you say. But I always say, I think we, we desire a good and so we get excited about it, but maybe less. So say just 15 minutes a day of some, some intellectual reading, intellectual reading. Now, what does that mean? Well, the content there, that's whatever you feel it is draws your desire whatever is a loved object of your intentional intellectual life um again there could be just random factoids but you probably have questions about things the faith is one of these things that you should probably know about and there's plenty of intellectual things to say about it uh, philosophy of course the great classics there's no reason not to include them in this the tradition the canon all this kind of stuff there's beautiful wisdom of the western Civil, Western civilization, the wisdom of, of Christ that's available. The final thing, though, I would say is just as you want to moderate your time, moderate the, what to say, the, uh, the strength of this intellectual reading. So if you say, well, I'm, I'm interested in doing, yeah, I'll do some political philosophy. I've always liked, I've always kind of liked politics, and I guess I should do some philosophy or something. So I'm just going to start straight off with, uh, I don't know, something like, uh, you know Hans Kelsen's the general state general the general study a state of of law or something the kind of classic of early modern law attempts and under, his account of this really abstract what is law and the Grund norm and all you're gonna put the book down you know you're gonna put the book down so shoot a little you want to just like when you're doing something athletically you want to play against someone who's a little better than you you know to get better to, to push yourself. But you don't want to play against someone who's just so much better than you that you're not going to play around. So don't just go and get the most complicated uh, book on a particular subject you want to read. Get something reasonable, something you read a first couple pages through something. Amazon has all these. You can brief through this. And if you get some of most of the words or like say more than half of them there and you think, yeah, some of them I didn't get, but I got, then that's that's a good start for it. If it's a, just a total slog, like if you wanted to study physics and you immediately pick up Robert, Roger Penrose's The Road to Reality, that's an 1100 page book for one. Uh, two, it has equations in tensor calculus. I don't even know tensor calculus and I did quantum mechanics. And so, I mean, that's, why is that in there? <laughs> you're gonna put that book down and learn nothing and you're just gonna go back. So give yourself a way, a, a, a stepping, a way to step further and to climb a ladder and to, to develop this life and to enjoy each step along the way as opposed to like delayed gratification of, I'll eventually enjoy it when I can understand what Hans Kelsen's talking about, the Grun norm. But until then, I'm just gonna suffer. No, the intellectual life is to be pleasurable where it is at all times. Yeah. No, I think that, um, yeah, maybe just to uh, add further commentary on the points that you've already described. But I think that the habit of study needs to be constant. All right. So it has to be something that is baked into your life. I'll often say that the habit of prayer has to be daily because that's just, mm -hmm. I mean, it's the language of relationship. Yeah. And Frequent. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so like I, I will often recommend to adult Christians that they pray for 20 minutes every day. Mm -hmm. um, with the habit of study, I don't think it's quite as important mm -hmm. that it be daily mm -hmm. um, because I think that when we talk about our contemplative lives, we're talking about a life that is fueled or nourished by both prayer and study. You might describe them as the two wings whereby the soul or spirit mounts to the contemplation of God. 
Right. But I, th I think that we afford a certain primacy in the Christian discourse to prayer, right? Mm -hmm. And that study is, it flows from prayer, it issues from prayer, it can never be a replacement for prayer. All right. So we shouldn't think about it as choose one or the other type thing. Yeah. But if you were to choose one, you should choose prayer. So I think that, <laughs> that, that study is subordinated, right? It's fueling prayer, it issues from prayer, et cetera. It's kind of like a feedback loop with prayer. Ought um, to be. It ought to be, yeah. right? I think that sometimes we can, you know, psych ourselves out by saying study or intellectual life. Some of those things might put us off. And if we think of ourselves as not being especially intellectual or gifted in mm -hmm. just such a way, we might give ourselves kind of blanket permission not to worry about those types of things. Mm -hmm. Right. I have more simple kind of uh, I have a more simple spirit. I have a more simple approach to the faith. That's all well and good. But I think on account of the fact that you're made to the image and likeness of God. Right. God has a claim on you to pursue him in this particular way. So he's given you a mind with which to know and a heart with which to love. And that heart is fueled by what the mind takes in. Mm -hmm. All right, so we should take in God and all things in light of God. And one of the ways in which we do so is, is through study. It's just, it's part of the input. Mm. Um, so I would say maybe a good number might be like five minutes a day. And if it's not every day, no worries, right? But maybe shoot for like 30 minutes a week. So like 10 minutes here, 10 minutes here, 10 minutes here, something like that. And I would say, like what you said about moderating it, you know, if you if you tend to shoot too high, all right, rein it in. But if you tend to shoot too low, maybe, you know, challenge yourself mm -hmm. a little bit. I don't know about physics and I don't know about law. I know a little bit about St. Thomas Aquinas. And people often ask, like, where do I begin with St. Thomas Aquinas? You don't have to read St. Thomas Aquinas to learn the Christian faith. Mm -hmm. Totally. Like, I wouldn't say totally, but it's it's not necessary. But if you have a passing interest in St. Thomas Aquinas, he wrote some things which are pretty simple and straightforward. Mm -hmm. So like Sophia Institute Press publishes a book called The Three Greatest Prayers, which yep. is his popular sermons on the Creed, the Our Father, and the Hail Mary, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the type of thing you could, you could read that book over the course of four months and feel like you're getting an introduction to the faith through the mastery of St. Thomas Aquinas, and you gain an appreciation for his terminology, mm -hmm. you know, for his grammar, and like you get more confident yeah. in your grasp of the it's, faith and in your- It's like a know. second language. It, you know, if you just start and think, I'm not gonna be able to, I don't understand this right away. No, as you're reading, you just keep reading and there's certain words that you think, ah, I don't know what that means, but you keep going and don't worry, you'll see them again. I mean, this is how people didn't learn, always learn languages by grabbing textbooks. They learn by just kind of keep talking and getting to the point. And it's the same way with the intellect, with big concepts and things. It's a second language. and. Just because you don't understand every word on a page doesn't mean that you'll not get it even by just reading it without looking it up. It will. We you speak English if you're listening to this or have an or you're well, if you're not listening if you're listening to this and you don't understand what we're saying again this is not for you. <laughs> but you probably have a sense. The other a sense of this. The other thing I would say is it's good to summarize. Um, some people journal, of course, and uh, their own thoughts and things. This is taking study your intellectual life just a little bit farther. Perhaps you don't need to write in all your books. That's a salubrious in some ways is to do this. But um, you might want at the end of your time reading something, just jot down a few. What were the main points? It is amazing how important it is to solidify the mind by re-expressing in your own conceptual language what you just got out of it. So if you're reading John Rawls and Theory of Justice and you've just read about the original position, the veil of ignorance, blah, blah, what would you explain? How would you explain that? Even better in some ways is to turn to the person next to you and punish them by saying, hey, honey, <laughs> do you believe about this veil of ignorance and the fact that it hides not only the probabilities of what will be, not only the positions what will be, but the probabilities of what we might be in a perfect society? Just add it, be careful with this, but explaining to someone what, you, what you've what you read intellectually bakes it into you, makes it your own thing, as opposed to just merely watching a spectator. So some way of regurgitating in, a, in your own words, whether it's in, in writing or an email, send an, you could even invent a friend and just send fake emails to, to him <laughs> or her with what you read today. And it's it's just surprising. Whenever I, when I'm writing, I always summarize, I'm reading things and put my own words. Uh, it's that's the only time I really actually get. Otherwise, I don't remember what I read sometimes. Yeah. I've read tire books, many books. And I don't know what's in them. <laughs> so maybe then just as a summary, a final point, we can think about it in the context of our Christian lives. You know, we occupy the role of a kind of agent. I'll be a secondary, albeit a secondary cause or an instrumental cause, but still God has has placed our lives in our hands so that we might, you know, take the reins and by his grace, you know, chart a course towards something great and glorious. And one of the ways in which we do so is through the life of study. So you're not just a passive recipient of things told, but you're also an agent. Right? Agent of truth. An agent of truth, like we said. So so both in the discovery of those truths or in, you know, the, the reception of those truths, the instruction of those truths, but also in the communication of those truths. Mm -hmm. It's often said that you don't fully know a thing until you've taught it. 
and you might not have a classroom in which to do so but you'll often have occasion in the context of your friendships, your family life, or whatever it might be to give expression to the faith, both as a way of solidifying it, but also as welcoming another into that same intellectual communion. So that's what we have for you today. Uh, thanks so much for listening to this episode of God's Planning. Um, please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Like the episode, subscribe on YouTube or on your podcast app and leave a five-star review in the goodness of your heart. Insofar as all of that helps to get the word out and to draw others into the intellectual life, which is to say, the Christian life. Those things are not the same, but I said it as if they were. If you'd like to donate to the podcast through Patreon, you can follow the link in the show notes or the episode description. And in those same show notes slash episode description, you'll find links to purchase merchandise, uh, Godsplaining merchandise, and to get information on upcoming Godsplaining events. So know of our prayers for you. Please continue to pray for us. We're very grateful for it. And we'll look forward to chatting with you next time on Godsplaining. Mm-hmm.